these Wednesday night sessions. I am, as always, your host, Mitch Nobis, and I'm excited because we have um, a guest I've been trying to get on in the show for a while. She doesn't know this, but she's on my list of people to invite for a long time um, and then kind of hit some hiccups and wasn't able to record for a while. So I'm excited that Ajane Dawkins is joining us today. Uh, like always, I'm going to toss it over to her for a reading, and then we'll do two questions afterwards. Uh, and viewers, thanks for joining us. Whether you're a first timer or a, a long time viewer, we appreciate you taking the time. Ajane, I'm going to throw it over to you. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the invitation. I'm really excited to be here. Um, okay, I'm going to read three poems. And the first one is called Final Poem for My Mother. Um, I wrote this poem thinking about what it means that I've been writing about my mom for years <laughs> um, and the experience um, for her of, of navigating her story always being told by me and kind of the ethics of that. Final poem for my mother after Philip B. Williams. I betrayed you. It's not that simple, but it is. Every day I can see more of myself my erratic beauty, my sick brain, my cruelty growing visible from beneath my gums. I am nauseous with regret and in love with the possibility of mending. It's impolite to say, but if you die now, I will never forgive myself. This is no eulogy. I am building the love of our future. I'm crafting you a tongue. I'm gathering ears. I am sewing my mouth shut with a steady hand. I know now, now I know, how memory is communal and not a gun. I want to archive your heart's largest valve, your decision to be a mother, all your secret dreams. I can't yet buy you a house, but I can build you a language without shame. Please forgive me for who I was, and I will forgive myself for wanting to make daughters. Knowing what I know now, I can love you better. Let us give our callous mouths back to the God of stone. Mama, pray with me for our rowdy blood, our split nerves, what comes in the morning. Mom, I'm a woman now, and it hurts to breathe. I'm a woman, and I can't see. <clears throat> um, okay, I'm going to go straight into the next one. I haven't mastered the mirror. Any muscle can be trained to resist, to flex against metal or idea. You can train the body against the body. I'm not a professional. But in the mirror, I trace the weakest band of tissues from blood to brain. Against them, I press my mouth to say, now I will dream myself in love with myself. I will dream myself beautiful as rose lace, ice forest, sprawling sun. Yes, maybe bits of the moon peek from between my teeth. Maybe I'm blushing everywhere. Maybe from between my legs. Lilies are whispering to God. <clears throat> um, okay. And I am going to read just one more poem. Um, so this piece is me thinking about, I have an aunt who um, disappeared years ago, probably was it 2023 she disappeared about 31 years ago um uh, so uh, right before I was born um and uh there's a lot of like things associated with her disappearance um but recently the fact of it has been very like haunting um for me thinking about how her disappearance um, impacted how I was raised um, and the relationships between 
women in my family. And then also, I think maybe just thinking about the fact of her in the world as a ghost, um, both like literally a ghost and also like this imprint that um, there are there were not a lot of answers about for a really long time in my family. So um, I wrote this uh, in what I imagined was her voice um, or loosely based off of her voice. Um, it's called, I used to think black girls were from Mars after Julie and Jeff. I used to think black girls were from Mars. Auntie told me once and I just believed her. It made sense. When she said it, I was in the braid shop, had three women isolating my head. They were dislocating the grammar of my hair into three parts of speech until language flowed down my back, until I was milk carton photo ready In my bag, I carry what even Beyonce must have but can't sing about. A flyer with a black girl's face on mine, my aunt's sunlit smile. Grease slick skin, still blood full and flesh heavy. This was from before the jugs sallowed her laugh fat. It's been too many years to beg, have you seen her? Still, I slink away from huddled trees. As if, according to the statistics, a stranger would bury me there before a lover. Of course, I did my groveling in prayer, but God stone mutes at the worst times. When you grief sick, searching, mad as hell lost yourself. When a man got his hands around your throat, missing sense, missing sense, missing sense. I'm still unlearning this idea. There is a hierarchy to prayer, or the pulse between the le- between my legs and obscenity of my discourse disqualifies my pleading. For all my fearful religious rearing, none of it saved me. I'm 27 and working to dismantle a false deity. A shot of concentrate grape juice masquerading as wine, masquerading as blood. I'm 27 and planning to return to Mars, dreaming of how I'll explain our rituals to aliens. Could you explain, I mean, these three women preening order from my scalp, the concept of tenderheadedness? or what gods our edges are laid to on the missing person's flyer? Is it just my eyes, or do our baby hairs look kind of like black women curled up at the altar? Thank you so much. Gosh, thank you for that reading, that last image, holy cow. Um, that, I've got Part, part of the format of the show that is hard is I can ask the two questions. Like there, there's <laughs> plenty I, I could ask right now about that poem alone. I mean, the 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 imagery of like the the support being there, like in the shop, as the three women are isosceling. What a great phrase! Um, and and they're supporting you at us. Uh, that was a great poem. <laughs> All three were. Thank you very much for the reading. Thank you so much. Wow, that's so cool. Um, and you're, I like your lead into it also, which, which kind of, uh, I'm going to use it as a bit of a transition into the first question. So you're talking about your, your aunt's ghost and, and kind of her presence in, in life. Um, even though she's not physically present, she is still present in a way, um, which I, I wonder how that connects. Eh, I, let me scrap how I was phrasing that. I'm wondering how your theological work informs your writing. So uh, if I'm getting this right, according to Twitter, you recently finished a, a degree in theology, mm. uh, which is awesome. Congrats, by the way. Um, and you're also on the Masthead for Eco Theo Review, which yes. gets into a lot of this stuff, right? So I guess I'm just going to throw that to you as a category. How do these things inform each other? How does the theological work inform the writing? How does the writing inform the theology? Um, this, this notion of, of presence being with us um, when maybe we can't necessarily prove it, but the presence is still there and like, you know, all all that. Yes, all of the things. Okay. Um, So there's like a multi-part answer to this question. So 
the first piece is that um so bell hooks in um remembered rapture she talks about um the the uh element of the spirit um in let me make sure I'm phrasing this right. And as she talks about the impact of the Black church and then Buddhism um, on her own faith and writing trajectory, she talks about how we don't take seriously the work of the spirit and the work and, and faith work as a critical part to our process and craft and how, especially when you're in academic spaces, um, you can say, oh, this thing came about because I developed my characters and I practiced my craft and I did all of these writing workshops and I studied under the great. But if you say that the spirit came upon me and that is how this work was able to come about me, people are going to be like, "Uh," at least depending on what kind of academic, because that's not the thing we take seriously in the academic context. Um, And so for, for one thing, my relationship to theology um, is really about my relationship to faith. And in my writing, um, I think about it as like a kind of co-laboring with the spirit um, to tell a story, to uncover a truth, to figure out some part of the human experience. Um, I don't consider most of my poems necessarily to be theological poems, but I do think something that a lot of them are figuring out is what does it mean to wrestle with our relationship to faith, which for me is really critical. So um, in whether it's um, me writing about my mom, writing about women in my family, a lot of um, either the characters or the speaker who is really often based on myself is in some way wrestling with God. Um, and whether that's wrestling through relationship, wrestling through anger um, at like a social, at, at something that is happening socially or that has happened materially, um, that to me, that even if God's name never appears in the poem, that is like a theological wrestling. So that's like part one. And um, then part two is for me, theology shifted the way that I look at the work of others and the poems of others. So I don't just look at um, the poems of some writers and think to myself, wow, this is a really beautiful, surreal text. I think about them as like having spiritual significance um, and, and, and real significant in the world. And I, I see them as almost like sacred. And I'm always thinking, what is it that this thing can teach me about God, can teach me about my relationship to God? Um, and there's uh, this uh, Trey Ferguson, I hope I'm not messing up his last name, but he's a pastor and theologian. And he recently said in a talk that theology is an, an endeavor of the imagination. And so I think that every time that I'm moving deeper into a theological space, I'm also moving deeper into myself as a writer and creator by um by asking God to expand my imagination to see more possibilities and more connections and um, I guess more language that can, that can be freaked inside out. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, I love that. <laughs> I love that. I love every part of that answer. I love <laughs> like there's a multi-part to it, right? I mean, that's, I, I always get a little bit leery when somebody answers a theological question with a very straightforward linear, like this, 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 like, hey. I think, it's, I think it might be a little more complicated than that. It's definitely more complicated than that. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I love how, like, in your answer, you kind of got at, without saying it this way, but I mean, you kind of got at the way that poetry is sacred, is a sacred act, and, and poems are sacred also. Like, you think about um, our culture at large, we're, we're not a great culture regarding poetry. Like, we, we devalue poetry, we don't pay poets, you know? Yeah. All the ways that we, we generally show respect, we don't necessarily, necessarily show it to poets and poetry. But whenever we're in a sacred moment, a wedding, a funeral, we'll bring in poetry. Yes. You know? So it's yes. sacred, but we still devalue it, which we probably also do with pretty much anything that's sacred in our culture. So I guess I'm thinking out loud. It's, really, a, it's, it's right in the line with everything else. Yeah. Yes. Thinking about 
thinking about the all of the sacred moments that poetry comes up, even thinking about the ways we sometimes dismiss the like spiritual nature of the creation process. Like yeah. when people are like, I don't know what happened. I sat down and this thing came out of me. It's almost like I blacked out. I was like, oh, interesting. <laughs> so when you started your answer, you hit the multi-part in the first part. That was what I was thinking. Like there's all, you know, we have crash interviews with thousands of writers and over and over again so many people say like I felt like I was a conduit you know I don't know that I had the idea so much as I was there and caught it and it like you know used me to get out into the world you know so yes. there's only like there there that was kind of what I was hoping you might get into and I asked the question like <laughs> it seems like they're the writing process of all things um feels like it has a, a mysterious unknown that may feel spiritual for a lot of writers yes very cool Second question has nothing to do with this. Ashton. <laughs> That's totally fine. <laughs> um, as we were saying before uh, we hit record, um, Ajana is one of my favorite kinds of guests to have on the show because we have so many phenomenal people from Michigan across the country and especially writers. Um, Michigan is kind of like, it's use a baseball metaphor. We're sort of like the farm system for a lot of the country. Like we, we have these phenomenal writers and then they go elsewhere because there's not a lot of great um writing jobs, I guess, uh, in, in Michigan, um, and a thousand other things. I'm not going to get into Michigan's economy and over-reliance on automotion, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Great people are from Michigan. Yes. <laughs> and often leave. Um, so you are a, a Metro Detroit native, uh, but you're no longer here. Uh, so I always like to ask people, um, if you were trying to... You know, Again, I'm having a hard time phrasing my questions today. Michigan is often kind of misperceived across mm -hmm. the country. Um, Detroit, especially, obviously, in a thousand different ways. Mm -hmm. um, but when you tried, I was also just reading about like the Great Lakes. I was reading an interview with somebody who was whatever kind of scientist studies lakes. Um, and they were trying to explain like to somebody from you know California, like who had never been here before, like, no, it's not like the lake, you can skip a stone all the way to the other side. Like it's like a mini ocean. There's all these things about Michigan that we can't really convey to folks who aren't from here. Um, so if you could convey to folks who aren't from Michigan, one thing, because you are you are now um, out mm. there away from Michigan, how, how would you help other people understand Michigan or Metro Detroit? Um, for those who haven't been here and don't have a firm grasp on what that's like or what it means. Wow. Um, oh, this is a much harder question. <laughs> it's a fun one to ask folks who aren't here anymore. Because, like, how do you capture all that? You know? Yes. So I unfortunately don't have the world's best things to say about Metro Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the world's best things to say about Metro Detroit. What I do and will always give my flowers to um, is Detroit. Um, I credit, deeply, deeply credit Detroit for um, the relationship that I have to poems. Um, and uh, so if I had to give that anything, um, oh my gosh, Detroit as a source, as a wealth, as um Detroit was probably the biggest resource that I could have ever had as um, a writer. The Detroit School of Poets, um, Erica Foreman, was my first poetry teacher when the suburbs of Detroit had literally nothing to offer to a Black girl interested in poems. <laughs> um, to a Black girl interested in poems and interested um, in uh, oral storytelling, oral storytelling traditions. Uh, like spoken word and slam. Um, my grandfather literally would, he was retired and he would drive me to Detroit twice a week for inside out literary arts programs, yeah. um, uh, poetry uh, after school programs in the library um, at the main library location um, right off of Wayne State's campus. Um, so Yeah, my all of all of my all of my love and all of the reverence that I have for Michigan is is swallowed up in the resource and culture and um God the wealth that is what what's able to make an artist in Detroit. Um whether it's through and and most of that for me was through the people like Detroit has its own history but most of what 
made me be able to access access that history and access the arts culture was through the like legacy being carried physically by people being carried by folks like Erica Foreman and Brittany Rogers and Justin Rogers and um, the myriad of folks who were um, at Inside Out um, who are I literally are still my closest friends to this day <laughs> um, and yeah so that that's what I'm gonna say I'm gonna say all my all of my words and credit for to Detroit um, for being for being a source of of culture that literally cannot be imitated yeah yeah it's I mean, it, i'm a really you know, i'm relocated from farm country we were talking about this before you yes record right i'm from the middle of, of michigan um very rural area so i'm kind of getting to know detroit later in life but that's um i've read about it all my life i grew up a reader right and then mm-hmm. you know i would come to detroit for like a tigers game or something very like outstater kind yes. of relationship with detroit um and it's it's been a real joy kind of as i've been down here for i don't know Ten plus years now, um, but getting to know the city better and, and trying to figure out the arts landscape and the landscape in general, like it is everything I had read, you know, from people mm. saying like, yeah, it's not like other cities. Like, yeah, you can totally see that. Like, I'm I'm obviously kind of an outsider perspective coming from a dairy farm to to Detroit. It's like, yeah, this is not like when I visited Chicago or New York. Like, it's, yeah. it's very unique, um, very cool city. Like, I really. Um, that's why I like asking that question to folks who are from here and moved. It's it's kind of impossible to describe for folks who aren't from here the the attitude and, and culture and um, just general vibe. Of, yeah, you know, it's unlike other places. Yes, um, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to ask a question to B because you mentioned Inside Out, and if if all mm-hmm. comes together properly, um, Peter Marcus will have an episode in the same season. He's uh, like one of the co-creators, I think, of Inside Out, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, he and I were talking about like Nandy Comer and like all the yes amazing people to come through. Um, but you're you co-host the Versus podcast with Brittany. So is that how you yes. and Brittany got to know each other? Yes, Brittany and I mm-hmm. met yeah, Inside so cool. Out Literary Arts Project at a Slam. I don't even remember what Slam was being hosted, but we met at a Slam, and um, that's how her met. Um, there's like a whole group of friends that like. We have literally been in everybody's wedding. At Brittany's wedding, we literally had to take an inside out literary arts picture because like we were <laughs> we were all there. So yes, that's how Brittany and I met. And um we have essentially became best friends, however, many years later. And uh now we are journeying through this writing life together, journeying through life, doing life together in general, but journeying through this writing life together. And we have Versus, our podcast. So yes, I credit Inside Out Literary Arts Project for everything about my, both almost everything about like my personal life um, via the relationships that I have and also my writing life. They are amazing. That is so cool. I had no idea. I guess I just kind of assumed you two must have known each other I don't know, from school or something, but it, no, you know, that is so awesome. Inside Out Literary Arts Project, I met her, her and her husband met there because of them. I ended up in Wisconsin for graduate or not for graduate school for undergrad. Like I would not have gone to UW-Madison if not for them and been a first wave scholar. So there's like my whole life <laughs> in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, that is all so cool. I'm, I'm glad I asked the question. That is that's yeah. fantastic. I feel like with this, this is like a, uh, behind the scenes like an easter egg uh factoid for the versus podcast or something <laughs> we uh we, we shout out inside out i think we did um we uh actually did when we did our thank yous at the end i think we thanked them in like one or two episodes like thanks guys for essentially everything um <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, Asha, this is this has been a, a real pleasure. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today, for reading and for the conversation. Um, like I said, you, you, I knew you had a Michigan background, so you've been on my list, and I'm glad I was finally able to get you on the show. So thank you for taking the time to do this. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Um, viewers, thank you for taking the time. And uh, We'll see how this season comes together. I think there should be one or two more episodes. We'll see when this airs. But uh, if not, there's always a future season. So if you are a new viewer, come back. There's a whole bunch of previous seasons at the Kickstart Farmington YouTube page. Um, And thank you for taking the time. We'll catch you next time.